want to welcome you to our continued teaching here through the Gospel of John, here in John chapter 12. Um, specifically today, in the section we'll be discussing, verses 37 through 43, we're going to be discussing how can you be so hard-hearted? <laughs> how can you be so hard-hearted? And with that in mind, I would like to read to you this morning, guard your heart. Above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Proverbs 4.23 Let me pray. Father, Lord, just bless this time in Your Word. God, I pray that for all of us who hear, Lord, myself included, God, that our hearts would remain soft. And if they're not soft, God, that You would plow them up, that You would break them up, Father, that they would become soft and moldable and shapeable in Your hands. Please just bless our time together here today in Your Word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We pick up the story here in verses 35 and 36 of John 12, where Jesus Um, said to the people, the light is among you for a little while. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Jesus here speaking about how He comes to illuminate our lives, which we discussed last week. But the problem is sometimes Jesus steps into our lives, into the course of our lives, and He flips the lights on and we don't like what we see and we go over and say, would you shut the light off? I don't like what I see. I don't want the light. And in those cases, it is possible for darkness to overtake you. And then verse 36 finishes out and says, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and he hid himself from them. Verse 37, so now Jesus creating distance from them. They've said, I don't want you, Jesus. I reject you. And so Jesus says, okay, and he hides himself. Though, verse 37, he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. Now, this just proves that though miracles are amazing, they are not normally enough to bring someone to genuine faith. The aim of miracles is so that we might believe. That's true. But without divine intervention, we'll just see the miracles as some amusement or maybe entertaining novelties. True faith, saving faith, does not arise from witnessing miracles of healing or even walking on water. If it did the crowds who had been following Jesus would have believed. Rather, the Bible says that faith comes from hearing the words of Christ. It's written in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Next, I want you to pay close attention here to the order of events. In John 37 through 43, this section clearly addresses the total depravity of humanity, of a human heart. First, here in verse 37, they did not believe in Him. And by the time you get to verse 39, they could not believe in Him. They made their decision. This is important to remember as we study this amazing passage together here today. Verse 38, So the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, Lord, Who has believed what he's heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? John here quoted from two prophecies in Isaiah. The first one here in this verse is from Isaiah 53 verse 1, where the entire chapter is dedicated to this suffering Savior, a messianic prophecy. And it starts out, verse 1, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Revealed. I want you to notice here in this quote from Isaiah, 
that Jesus references. That first, it's the rejection of Jesus' words. They rejected what they heard. Also, it's a rejection of Jesus' miraculous works. The arm of the Lord had been revealed to them. But even though they heard Jesus' powerful teaching and witnessed His amazing deeds, they still refused to believe due to their hard hearts. They were like the pathway soil described for us in the sower, in the seed. The hard pan heart there on the far left. No matter what Jesus did, nothing He ever said or did took root in their lives and bore fruit. Verses 39-40 through 40. Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes. He's hardened their heart. Lest they see with their eyes, understand with their heart, and turn and I would heal them. As John reflected on the Jews' refusal here to believe, he used Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10, to describe what took place spiritually. Now, at this point in the book of Isaiah, he's having a vision where he has seen the Lord Himself on His throne, high and lifted up. And he heard the Lord tell him to say to Israel, again, Isaiah 6.10, make the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy, their blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. This particular prophecy from Isaiah in the Old Testament is referenced multiple times in the New Testament. In fact, it's referenced five separate times. It's important. The first time occurs in Matthew chapter 13, verses 14 through 15, right after Jesus finishes sharing the parable of the sower and the seed. And he's explaining why he speaks to the people in parables when he quotes it. The next time, Mark chapter 4, 11 uh, through 12. Again, immediately after Jesus uh, shares about the the parable of the sower and the seed, he quotes Isaiah 6.10. Luke 8.10 affirms the same thing. Immediately after the parable of the sower and the seed, Jesus brings up this explanation from Isaiah 6.10. Then we have it here in John 12, 39 through 40. And then finally, in Acts 28, verses 26 through 27, Paul quoted it after attempting to persuade Jews for an entire day, debating at his residence while he was on house arrest in Rome. Then, after quoting this verse, Isaiah 6.10 to them, a large portion of the Jewish crowd left, offended. How can this possibly be? How can anyone be so hard-hearted? The evidence for the truth of Jesus is overwhelming. Why not just repent? Why not just believe? Can we really be that dense? That evil? The answer to that is an overwhelming yes. Yes, we can. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18 goes on at length where Paul quotes from the Old Testament and says, as it's written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their path are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's how hard-hearted we could be. The prophet Jeremiah describes it this way about the natural human heart. In Isaiah 17, 9-10, The heart is deceitful above all things desperately sick or desperately wicked, then he writes, who can understand it? Meaning it doesn't make any logical sense that we would be that hard-hearted, that we would be that evil, that we would be be willing to reject the truth. Then it continues, verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart, (laughs) I test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So our heart, it's broken. 
naturally. We need uh, supernatural intervention. Isaiah 53, verse 6, the chapter goes on and says, All we like sheep have gone astray. How many of us? All of us. Me, you, everybody. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, speaking of the coming Messiah, the iniquity of us all. Now, regarding how hard-hearted a human heart can be, God gave us a fabulous example in the Old Testament, um, in the book of Exodus, in the life of Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh, again, he's going against Moses, but not ultimately Moses. Moses is the messenger of Yahweh. He's the messenger of God. And Pharaoh is fighting against what God wants to do in his life. Now, how Pharaoh's heart grew hard is interesting. Scripture clearly states two things about Pharaoh's heart. Multiple places. It says that God Himself hardened Pharaoh's heart. And multiple places say that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Here's just two of those 19 different occurrences. 19 different times God highlights the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. Exodus 8.15 says, But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite from the plague, he hardened his heart and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Exodus 9.12, But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Now we have God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Well, which is it? Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Or did Pharaoh harden his own? I suggest to you it's not an either-or situation. It's both. Pharaoh refused to listen to the Lord. He rejected God. So God responded by fortifying Pharaoh's unbelief. God gave Pharaoh what he demanded. Now, along the way, Pharaoh's heart became so unreasonably hard that even his own counselors and the people of Egypt begged him to let Israel go. Again, the heart is so deceitful and desperately wicked, who can understand it, right? Logically speaking, we look and we go like, what, are you nuts? Just, why can't you see this? Well, the people reached that place in Exodus uh, chapter 10, verse 17, or verse 7. Then Pharaoh's servants said to him, how long... Shall this man be a snare to us? Let the people go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not understand that Egypt is ruined? Now, no matter how many miracles Pharaoh witnessed or the words that he heard from God through Moses, he refused to believe. We see another example of hard-heartedness here in Jesus' own public ministry where he is speaking with his own people, the Jews. And we look and we wonder how in the world the Jews could possibly reject him. How could they refuse to believe? No matter how many miracles they witnessed or how powerful the teaching they received, not from Moses like Pharaoh did, but directly from God himself in the flesh, they refused to believe. We sit in stunned disbelief. It's easy to say to Pharaoh, for heaven's sake, just let the people go. Can't you see that God is in control? It's easy to say to the Jews of Jesus' day, for heaven's sakes, how can you not see that Jesus is obviously your Messiah? How can you reject Him? But, before we rise to condemn Pharaoh or the Jews of Jesus' day, I think we should pause and Ponder our own reflection in the mirror for a moment. In the realm of hard-heartedness, our own society puts their society to shame. We are asleep, unaware, or just plain willfully ignorant in a tidal wave of evidence, both in miracles and in teaching. In miracles and in teaching. Regarding miracles... Healings in the medical realm, uh, even still today, 
are fairly common. It's not all the time. God does not always choose to heal. But there are many moments where God does intervene and He does heal and the doctors are left stunned. But I'm not even speaking about those. I'm also speaking about the greater understanding we have in our culture today of macro, massive, and micro, tiny miracles. We know them through science. We are eyewitnesses to the endless proof of God and the vastness of His universe. Galaxies beyond number that are spinning in undeniably ordered operation. We are eyewitnesses to microscopic miracles of atoms, of DNA. Undeniable proof of God literally holding us all together day in, day out supernaturally, preloading us as well with brilliant genetic information before we ever even take our first breath. Logically, it's, informa- uh, it's undeniable proof of God's loving presence, of His purpose. Yet we reject it. We chalk it up to explosive gas, an evolving slime. And you're just like, what? That doesn't make any sense. You're right, it doesn't. It's because it's inaccurate. But we don't just reject miracles. We also reject teaching. His amazing teaching, Jesus' amazing teaching, we are drowning in both resources of His teaching and validation of it. We have easy access to copies of His Word and paper. All a myriad of study Bibles you can choose from. The Bible online, the Bible on apps, the Bible on radio, the Bible on commentaries, the Bible on podcasts, on uh, on YouTube, and on and on and on and on it goes. In every single way imaginable, we have the opportunity to hear from God directly. Plus, we live in an age where His Word has been completely validated. Validated through fulfilled prophecy through archaeology, through manuscripts, through other historical documents, through ongoing discoveries like the Dead Sea Scrolls. All of these validating everything God teaches over and over and over again. This truth is undeniable. You have to be incredibly hard-hearted to continue denying it. So my encouragement is let's not sit around and wonder how Pharaoh could possibly be so hard-hearted. We are surrounded in society today by little pharaohs. We might even be little pharaohs ourselves. Again, I want you to notice the spiritual digression caused by rejecting Jesus. First, they did not believe. Next, they could not believe. The Lord went to extravagant lengths to demonstrate His love for them. Yet they despised Him. They rejected Him. Therefore, God granted their request. God gave them what they demanded. They sowed the seed of rejection in their own souls and now a heart that loved darkness rather than light was the only fruit found to be harvested from the soil of their souls. Warning. We need to be aware that the same sort of hardening can happen to us and is happening in our general society today. Paul warned us in advance in the book of 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-12 through when he said, The coming of the lawless one, speaking of the Antichrist, is by the activity of Satan and he'll come with all power and false signs and wonders. That's false miracles. And with all wicked deception, that's false teaching. For those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth. Because they refused to love the truth and and so be saved. So because of that, verse 11 starts out, Therefore, as a result of that rejection, therefore God sent them strong delusion. So that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It's 100% true that without the power of the Holy Spirit working in my life, I will be totally unable to believe in Jesus. 
I need supernatural intervention. A.W. Pink, the commentator, put it this way, God does not have to put forth any power to cause any sinner to not believe. If he leaves him to himself, he never will believe. The author of Hebrews wrote it this way and said, Hebrews 2, 3 through 4, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord. It was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. (laughs) How will you and I escape so great a salvation if we neglect it? We won't. We should rather receive the exhortation by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 55, 6-7 when he wrote, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man His thoughts and let Him return to the Lord. Why does Isaiah encourage us if we are living with a hard heart to repent and return to the Lord? Because he said, God will have Uh, compassion on him. God will have compassion on you. He's not up in the sky wanting to condemn you. No, he wants to have compassion on you if you'll just simply return and repent. And then he said, and to our, excuse me, then he said, and to our God who will abundantly pardon. I don't know about you. Well, I do know (laughs) because I know me. We need to be pardoned. And we don't just need a little pardon. We need abundant pardon. (laughs) We have sinned and we need it. We will never arrive at a place of genuine faith of our own doing. Rather, God, who I like to call the master gift giver, He pursues us instead in our lost estate and He extends the gift of salvation to us. Even faith in Jesus itself is a gift from God. True faith, it is a gift from God. Paul, the apostle, famously wrote about it this way in Ephesians 2, 8-9. through For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Now, if it wasn't a gift from God, and there was something that you and I could do about it, to earn it, then guess what? Our sinful, wicked hearts, the natural ones we have, would be arrogant about our faith. We'd be hard-hearted. So, the Apostle Paul continues in verse 9, Our faith is not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. No one can boast. Now listen to me. God wants to give us this gift. Ask, you'll receive. Matthew 7. Seek Him and you'll find Him. Jeremiah 29. We need to ask God, would you please, Lord, soften the soil of my soul? And what will God do? Oh, He'll answer the prayer and He'll do it. Chapter 12, verse 41. Isaiah John wrote, said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Now, in context, we discover another beautiful reminder here of the deity of Jesus Christ. Remember, John has been quoting from Isaiah chapter 6. How does Isaiah 6 begin? Well, we're going to briefly read through the majority of this incredible chapter. I want to highly encourage you this week to read and reread it multiple times. Marinate in this section of God's Word this week. Let it wash over you. Isaiah 6, 1-10 through 10. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Who did He see? He saw Yahweh. He saw God. Sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood seraphim. Each had six wings. With two He covered His face. With two He covered His feet. And with two He flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. The foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of Him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. 
Isaiah responded and said, Woe is me. For I'm lost. I'm hard-hearted. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of the hosts. Again, who does Isaiah see? Oh, he sees God, right? He sees Yahweh. And who initiates the vision? The Lord did. He's pursuing Isaiah to give him this gift. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he'd taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Now, why does God refer to himself in the plural as us? Well, it's because he's the Father, he's the Son, he's the Holy Spirit. So therefore... When Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on his throne, he not only saw the Father, he not only saw the Holy Spirit, he also saw the Son. He saw Jesus. Then God said, verse 9, Go, say to this... Oh, and he said, Here am I, send me. Then he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, don't understand, keep on seeing, but don't perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy, blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. If you go back here to verse 41, Isaiah, or John is saying that Isaiah saw Jesus when he saw the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. He is God in the flesh. Verse 42 through 43 Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They loved the glory of man more than the glory of God. Listen, true faith, Not only is it a gift from God, but it cares more about what God thinks. I believe there are two different classes of unbelievers. First, we've already covered hard-hearted disbelievers. These are those who are so hard-hearted like Pharaoh, they just simply refuse to believe. Class number two, we have make-believers. These are those who temporarily are interested, but they fail to yield their hearts completely captive to Christ. They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. These value the opinions of sinful men and their own position in the social circles more than the Lord. They are an excellent example of the parents of the man born blind. Not familiar? If you're not familiar with the story, go read it this week in John 9. It's such a great story. But the parents of the man born blind, I don't know if you remember, but they reject their own son. They abandon their own son in his greatest hour of need because they are afraid of the Pharisees and they are afraid of being put out of the synagogue. (laughs) Make believers in all their glory. Make believers prefer the approval of sinners over the approval of God. Now, I ask you an important question. What good would the acceptance of the Pharisees and a seat in the synagogue do them when they stood before the judgment seat of Jesus one day? They're worthless. Mark 8.36, Jesus speaking about this said, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? John 5.44, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you don't seek the glory that comes from the only one and only God. And then Jesus' half-brother, James, in James chapter 4, verse 4, said, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God or hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you want to be a friend of the world, then you need to understand you took a a stance. It's not neutral. You are now an enemy of God. You can't have it both ways. Make believers. Now, true believers 
Well, they behave a lot like the man born blind himself. Again, go reread the story. It's so rich. He identified himself so completely with Jesus that he didn't even care what happened to him. He didn't care what the Pharisees said. He didn't care if he got kicked out of the synagogue. He lived and he said, all right, I'm with Jesus. I'm with the man who healed me. I'm with him. I don't care what you think. And so he takes a bold stand for Jesus. Now, as we close our time together here, we turn once again to the parable of the sower and the seed. And it's here in this parable that we find both classes of unbelievers more fully described. Matthew chapter 13, verses 18 through 23. It's here that Jesus is explaining the parable to the disciples. Hear then the parable of the sower, said Jesus. When anyone hears the words of the kingdom and he does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. That's class number one, the hard-hearted disbelievers. As for what is sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises, or you could say the approval of the Pharisees, on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Make believer. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. The cares of this world, that is their position in the synagogue, right? That's make believers. Now, as for what is sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case, a hundredfold, another 60 and in another 30. Now, it would be foolish right now not to do a little heart evaluation. So I encourage you to close your eyes. Let's do an EKG on our hearts. Just between you and the Lord. How do you respond to these questions? What's holding you back from really stepping out in faith with Jesus? Do you believe If you do, are you willing to lay it on the line for your Savior like He laid it on the line for you? Are you merely content to use your relationship with Jesus as a crutch to fall back on when you're in trouble or in need? Or do we believe when we're on the front lines of faith at war with those who mock the name of Christ? Yes or no? You can open your eyes. What should we do if we find ourselves trapped inside a hard heart? Ah, Simple. We should ask God for a spiritual heart transplant. He's happy to do so. He gave Saul a heart transplant in the book of Acts and he transformed him into the Apostle Paul, a lion of a man for Christ. Maybe you... Think you're trapped behind a mask of make-belief. Well, I have great news for you. From this group of make-believers that John is referencing here that were worried about the opinions of their peers. Out from that group stepped two men into history eventually, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. After witnessing the trial and the beating and the brutal execution of Christ, they no longer cared about their peers' opinions or about their position in the synagogue. God can transform a human heart, no matter how hard, if we'll just simply ask, if we'll just be like David and pray when he was convicted about his season of hard-heartedness, when he wrote Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Now, Why would he have to use the word create to begin with? It's because it's not in us. It's not natural to us. Our natural heart is jacked up. We need a new heart. And if we ask God to create a new heart within us, God will do it. He'll renew a spirit in us that beats for the Lord, that wants to live for the Lord. In the meantime, 
While we pray this prayer, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. In the day-to-day of our lives, let's be reminded of Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart. Don't let it get hard. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Now, God answered this prayer for David. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. And He'll do the same for you. Just ask. You will receive. God is a willing gift giver and He is the heart healer too. Father, thank You so much for our time together today in Your Word. It's an incredible gift. Father, just bless the teaching of Your Word. Lord, use the truth of your word to change us from the inside out. We give you, Jesus, all praise, all glory, all adoration. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to tune in. We'll see you next week.